If you're in the market for an entry-level luxury SUV, the Mercedes GLA and the Mercedes GLB are both fantastic options. But which one is the right one for you? The red pill or the blue pill? I'm AJ, you're watching Altiga Fuel, and we'll look at what we have here. This is the new GLA, and in terms of design, this is already quite different than the GLB. This is a lot more hatchback on stilts, a little bit more crossover in its design language. You can also see that here with the more horizontal um, headlamps. Of course, you get multi-beam LED. This is an option here in the AMG line, which also means you get the AMG grille with the really cool wings. On the other corner, in the blue corner, the GLB has a more traditional SUV design and a traditional SUV proportion. For example, the shorter headlamps. And while this also has the AMG grille, it's a little bit more wider. And overall, to me, this is a bit more proportional and the one that I like a little bit more. The side profile is also where these two SUVs vary significantly. Of course, the GLB is taller and longer. This is about 4.6 meters long or about 180 inches. With the AMG line, you also get these nice 19 inch AMG wheels. From my eyes, this is a very good looking SUV design. You have a nice three box structure, sharp straight lines, this really tall and flat roof line. I also like the contrasting chrome colored uh, roof rail and the window uh, frame. Also very neat curved lines on the door as well. Overall, it's a pretty sharp looking car. What do you think? In contrast, the GLA is smaller at 4.4 meters long or about 173 inches. Similar AMG line 19 inch wheels and similar chrome finish along the window frame as well as on the roof rail. But the C pillar is significantly more curved than the GLB. It's a lot more hatchback to my eyes. In fact, I find these two SUVs kind of similar to the way the GLC and the GLE compare. But which one is your favorite in terms of design? Put it down in the comments below. Wow, the difference in the back is very significant. You can already tell the difference in the height between these two SUVs. And again, further emphasizing the more hatchback design of the GLA and the more upright SUV design of the GLB. Some interesting details, for example, you have these faux exhaust vents or rather air vents here on the GLA. And both of these have a diffuser with a cosmetic exhaust tip. As you can see, the key fobs for the two SUVs are identical. And you get keyless entry, so just put the key in your pocket and the door opens. The GLB has a nice, tall, straight and flat front door. It opens fairly wide as well. There's some nice soft touch materials on the top of the door and there's microfiber inlay over here. Seat controls, seat heating, the window controls and the mirror controls and a door pocket, although there is no felt lining, just a bit of a rubber lining. There's different seat options. As you can see, what we have here is the microfiber and the Artico or the MB Tex. This is a synthetic leather. So that's pretty great that you get animal free interiors. Depending on when you're watching this and which model you're, um, SUV you're looking at, the Artico seats did come with seat ventilation, but at the moment, when we're filming this, it's no longer an option. Getting inside the GLB is really easy. Tall door, higher ground clearance means I don't have to stoop down or climb up that much, and getting inside is very easy. And inside, I'm greeted by the fantastic Mercedes interior design, which is one of my favorites. So let's get inside and take a closer look at the details. These specific seats also come with adjustable under thigh support. The glove box is nice and spacious and also has a little shelf for added practicality. I love interior design, especially the ambient lighting that Mercedes employs, and this reflects so well around this area. This material inlay can also be changed based on the trim level. A lot of glossy black around here, but again, ambient lighting inside these turbine design air vents, which also shine and reflect within this well, really nice. Climate control with physical buttons, so that's really easy to operate while on the move. A nice wide center console with a tambour door, with a wireless phone charger, USB-C. You have slightly adaptive cup holders, not so much, and they're quite shallow, but 
They can hold like a coffee cup, maybe not a tall water bottle. There's a very shallow little tray here, which doesn't really fit a phone and not much else. So I'm not quite sure what you would put on this. Up here you have the dynamic drive mode selector, volume control, and the parking camera button. There's a nice center armrest, which splits to open and show uh, and reveals a pretty deep cubby hole with further USB-C. We're very familiar with this MBUX, but what you can already see is that this is not the latest version that we see, for example, in the GLC or the E-Class with the much more phone-like main screen widgets. Still, for example, in the navigation, you have a little section to show you with your media and your phone. You can also use Android Auto or Apple CarPlay. And while it doesn't occupy the whole screen and there are pretty big bezels, it's really sharp and bright. I know that capacitive buttons are in general not a great idea. However, since I'm very familiar with the steering wheel and have spent significant time driving Mercedes cars with this wheel, I can tell you that the fact that there are four individual spokes which handle very distinctive functions, there are nice indentations, and there is in fact a way to actually press them in for a genuine physical haptic feedback, this is a really decent system. There's also a really nice grip and you get paddle shifters behind the steering wheel to change the eight-speed dual clutch transmission as well. The instrument cluster can also be customized to different views like the sport view, which is a lot more engaging to look at or the understated look. If you choose, you can even have the navigation broadcast across the entire screen, although your Android Auto navigation does not come on the screen here. Oh boy, look at the amount of space I have back here. This is the GLB, right? So this is much taller. So headroom is plenty. Knee room is also plenty. This seat is set to my driving position. I'm about five foot eight or 170 uh, centimeters. And let's not forget, I can also slide this bench further up. And at the, fur uh, the furthest position up, I still have just about enough knee room. I can also recline the back bench you know, okay, this is too upright for my taste, but this is about nice and comfortable. So if you have the seventh, uh, seven seat option with the third row, in a pinch, you could actually liberate some more space for the rear passengers and three AJs could sit one behind the other. What I'm not so fond of is this really dark interior. I like lighter colors. It makes the cabin feel a lot more spacious and airy. You can also get an optional panoramic sunroof, which I would always recommend. And of course, the seat colors and fabrics, even for the headliner, you have different choices. Isofix mounts on the outside two seats, not here in the middle. An armrest with adaptive cup holders here in the middle. They can also just fold this piece down as a ski hatch if needed. So again, so much flexibility, which makes this a really nice practical family car. Air conditioning vents and charging ports as well. Let's go check out the GLA. The door opens really nice and wide, so getting inside is not going to be that difficult. You might notice the different design for the inlay here with the three-spoke star, but everything else is pretty much the same as the GLB that we saw. So microfiber and Artico or MBTEX synthetic leather for the seats inside, and again, a very black interior color scheme. Getting inside, the roof is a little bit uh, shorter, and it does feel a lot more car-like to sit inside. The design is very familiar to the GLB, but there are some subtle differences. So why don't you join me inside? The main difference in the dashboard design is this section up here. Sure, the inlay is a little bit different, but so is the shape of this cutout. The same glove box with the nice utility of that shelf up here. The same climate control menu with, with actual buttons and knobs. The same tambour door with the inductive phone charger, cup holders, and the rest of the center console. Of course, the MBUX is also the same, but here you can take a quick look at the Apple CarPlay. And again, there's quite a bit of space that's left out and again, a pretty large bezel, but the clarity is really nice and crisp. Yet, you see there's a navigation running here. It doesn't mirror that onto the other screen for the instrument cluster. Nevertheless, you have the same options for different uh, screens that you can choose from. And finally, the same steering wheel with the same capacitive buttons on these four spokes. 
and the same paddle shifters. The interior of the GLA in isolation is actually not bad. Again, plenty of knee room, plenty of headroom for me, five foot eight, my driving position. And as you can tell, I'm not really cramped in here. The footwells are also really nice and deep. So I have plenty of space to slide my feet under the front seat as well. And of course, the bench slides forward. And yeah, with the bench all the way in the front position, my knees are touching the front seat. And I don't have much flexibility to recline the seat. I mean, it, it kind of tilts forward, which is really uncomfortable, but this is as far as it goes back. But you can also spec this with a lighter interior and of course a sunroof would make things much more uh, lively inside. Let's take a look at the trunk of both of these SUVs. As you can see, they both get automatic tailgates. The GLB as expected has the bigger trunk at 560 liters. And if we put our ruler here, you can see that you get about 90 centimeters or about 35 inches in terms of the actual length. This other significant dimension, of course, is the height. It's about 76 centimeters or about 30 inches. Now, the practicality is further enhanced by the fact that you can get the GLB with a seven seater option. So there will be two seats that are flush with the seat, uh, with the floor, and you can actually pop them up. Although you can imagine it's not going to be for full size adults. Maybe children will fit in there. This doesn't have the seven seats. So you get more, um, you get more volume down here. Now the back seats are also where the fun continues because there's a lot of versatility. You can slide the rear bench in individual compartments like this, and you can also tumble the rear seats all the way flat. And the same goes for this bench. And now you have much more loading area. The GLA has only 435 liters of trunk capacity. That being said, this is, I would say, sufficient for daily use. You're still getting 77 uh, centimeters or 30 inches. And then also in terms of height, it's about 77 or 30 inches. So it's a pretty usable area, very rectangular as well. And further volume is uh, available below the floor. The parcel shelf is more rigid in this case, but you can easily pop that out. And interestingly, the bench also slides forward and tumbles all the way flat. You can get these two SUVs with a wide range of engine options, depending, of course, on your specific market. Here we have the same exact engine. This is the 250, which means that it's a two liter inline turbo four petrol engine. Uh, this comes mated to the 8G DCT dual clutch automatic transmission. It's of course, as you can see, a transverse mounted front wheel drive layout and hence the packaging is a lot more compact and provides more space for the cabin. But that also means that the 4Matic, the all wheel drive system, is an on-demand multi-plate clutch based system. Same goes, of course, for the GLA. The GLA is a little bit lighter as expected at 1,700 kilos as compared to the GLB, which means that it can accelerate zero to 100 kilometers per hour or zero to 62 miles per hour a little bit quicker, 6.8 seconds versus seven seconds. They both, of course, have the adaptive suspension equipped in this particular case. This engine makes 224 PS or metric horsepower and has a mild hybrid system so you get an additional 14 PS as a boost. All right, let's start off with the GLA. I'm here on the countryside and there's a nice country road. So let's go to the dynamic selector and put the car in sport mode. The engine, the adaptive suspension, the steering, the stability control, and the sound of the engine are all adapted now. And if I slow down, check my surroundings and bring it to standstill. Let's put our foot down, here we go. I would say it's healthy performance. Remember, 224 horsepower, PS metric horsepower, with an additional 14 PS with the mild hybrid boost. It's a good amount, it's a healthy amount. This is also a pretty light car. The steering does get a little bit heavier, but I wouldn't say that the feedback is 
phenomenal, but at least there's a nice tautness. The suspension, the damping has become a lot more firm, but at the same time, the surface is quite rough and I don't really feel that. So it's not filtering the sharpness, but it's keeping the car quite planted. The compact dimensions of the GLA also mean that it's really confidence inspiring around these little narrow lanes here in the countryside. I don't feel like I'm going to be going off the road or if there's a car coming from the opposite direction, I also can squeeze it between that gap much more easily. The engine also sounds pretty nice. It's not terrible, it's not fantastic. I would say it's enjoyable in uh, short stints on occasion. Visibility is also really nice because of this tall windshield and you're sitting a little bit higher up. So you also have a nice view kind of straight down the hood as well. Even the brake feel is pretty confidence inspiring. So yes, you can have a little bit of fun with the GLA. It doesn't feel top heavy, it doesn't feel like it's gonna roll. So I guess this is the added benefit of the fact that the GLA is more of a hatchback crossover than a pure SUV. So this is definitely a little bit more engaging and a little bit more sporty to drive. Here we go, out on the highway. Merging onto oncoming traffic is a breeze. 220 horsepower, 224 is I would say sufficient. And let's talk about the GLA's highway mannerisms. First thing that stands out to me is actually a negative point, and that is the noise in the inside. I have spent a couple hours with each of these cars driving on the Autobahn, and I've noticed that they are not as quiet as I would have liked them to be. You can hear everything. You can hear the tires, you can hear the wind, and you can also hear the engine, even here in the comfort mode. And as of the day of filming, there is no option to get the acoustic comfort pack or the like, which will increase the sound deadening and have more acoustic dampening glass uh, for the windshield and windows. So therefore, I feel like this is a little bit um, not meeting my expectations of a Mercedes or even a car at this price point, I would expect it to be a little bit quieter. That being said, the seats are actually really comfortable. They're very firm, but at the same time, they support you really well. You have a lot of adjustment, including things like the lumbar support. And the visibility out the side, the front, and the rear window is also really nice thanks to these tall windows. The adaptive cruise control, the lane keeping assist, so the ADAS systems are also pretty useful. They're not as sophisticated as, for example, the latest GLC has. We can watch our review of that. For example, that has a feature where it will automatically overtake cars when it notices that you're going slower than you need to be and there's no traffic on the, uh, the, the inside lane. This doesn't get features like that, but it still has a pretty confident and very uh, safe adaptive cruise control system. Other than that, let's talk a little bit about the mileage. So here in the comfort mode, and on the highway for about 200 kilometers, we're getting um, around 8.7 liters for 100 kilometers. And that's a little bit on the higher side, if you ask me. I wasn't driving any faster than 150, and that too for very short periods of time. And like you see right now, there is a bit of uh, traffic, so we are going at 100 kilometers per hour. And I should be seeing much better uh, average fuel economy numbers than 8.7. So another thing to keep in mind there. This is a bit of a new engine, sure, but in general, this is not as efficient as I was hoping. The suspension is doing a great job of keeping this car planted. It's really sure-footed, even at high speeds. It's also really comfortable. So suspension is definitely doing a really good job. The steering is also pretty heavy, and with the steering assist, it kind of fights you for it, but it weighs up really nice, so on the highway, you get a little bit more of that surety as well. So the GLA is definitely very suitable for long distance drives out on the open highway. Now we're in a little village and I think the GLA really shines with its compact dimensions and its slightly higher seating position. You can really place the car very well and very confidently in these narrow little lanes. The suspension is also doing a really nice job at these low speeds to soften the sharp bumps of these cobblestones and these 
uh, other, you know, uh, underlenses that you find in small cities. The steering is also really light and responsive, so it's really easy to make quick corrections to dart in and around cars and traffic as well. All right, now the GLB. Yes, it's bigger and a bit heavier. Same engine. Does that mean it's slow and cumbersome to drive? Well, back to dynamic button, to the sport mode, and let's put our foot down. The short answer is no. Healthy acceleration, decent steering feel and weight, very similar, of course, driving these two back to back. They behave very similar. The suspension is a bit tighter, but again, it doesn't let any of the sharpness filter in. It just gives you a little bit more tautness. This longer wheelbase actually lends it an even more planted and secure feeling here in the GLB. So that taller height, it's a little bit compensated with this slightly longer wheelbase. You end up feeling almost as secure and as confident around these corners as you did in the GLA. Although I must say, it doesn't feel as sporty as the GLA, but that's only by a very, very small margin. And again, because of that narrow width, it's easy to place the car in a gap when there's oncoming traffic like we just had. And on narrow little roads like this, you don't have to break the speed limit to have fun. The engine does sound quite nice. Same engine, so similar noise. So yeah, I'm actually pleasantly surprised that the GLB is, I would say, 90% as fun to drive on these winding roads as the GLB. The brake also performs really well. The same place I had to brake last time, because the weight difference is not that significant. Ultimately, just a little bit more body roll than the GLA, but still, a real hoot around corners. Out on the highway, the GLB is actually a little bit louder than the GLA. So that was the first thing I mentioned. And because the aerodynamics of the GLB is seemingly worse, I feel like the wind noise is a lot more audible. But similarly, the, the, the same issue it persists in terms of the tire noise and even the engine noise filtering into the cabin. It's definitely not uncomfortable, but it's definitely not up there with my expectations. So definitely something to keep in mind when you test drive your car. But again, the ADAS and um, the other systems are all pretty much the same. They're not the best in the Mercedes suite, but at this price point, in this entry level segment, it's definitely very useful and very confidence inspiring. Even the speed limiter, which I like to use, um, on country roads and in the city. You can adapt that to this traffic sign directly with one button, and it even brakes when you are over the speed limit. So it's got extra features like this, which is really nice. Augmented reality for the navigation is an option, but also really nice to have if you're somebody who needs that additional um, input for your navigation. The seats are the same, very comfortable. There's not much of um, there's not much of side bolstering, but I don't think you really need it. So overall, the GLB feels even more spacious on the inside and therefore even more better at long distance cruising with your family. There's more headroom and it feels a little bit more spacious, even for the driver. But the noise is a little bit louder than the GLA. In terms of mileage, this also shows because of the weight and the aerodynamic disadvantage that the GLB has. It says 8.9 liters for 100 kilometers, and I've only been driving uh, for about 200 kilometers today, and it's mostly been on the Autobahn, and I haven't really pushed it beyond 150 kilometers per hour, and that too for a very short per uh, periods of time. So I think this is probably another negative point after the sound insulation is the fact that this engine is a little bit thirsty. But overall, I think the GLB is starting to be evidently the better pick of the two, simply because you're not compromising city capabilities in terms of maneuverability and parking. 
You're not compromising much in terms of dynamic capability out on twisty roads. And while it's a little bit louder on the highway, the space means that this is a lot more capable for long distance family road trips. Is the GLB any more difficult to drive in the city? Well, no, because the width is pretty much the same. It's only taller and longer. And sure, the length does mean that finding a parking spot, especially in these parallel parking situations on the sides of these roads, might be a little bit trickier. It's definitely not cumbersome. You also, yes, don't have rear axle steering like the GLC platform would. And while the GLB and the GLC are similar in size, I think there's not much that you're losing out in terms of maneuverability without that rear axle steering. Visibility is again really easy, it's really great, so it's really easy to place the car in these narrow lanes. The steering is really light here in the comfort mode at these low speeds. Suspension as well is performing really well to soften out these bumpy little cobblestones here in these European villages. Tall windows on the side mean I can easily peer through and place the car um, in these uh, narrow lanes. So overall, it's not, it's definitely not a challenge to drive this and it's not that much bigger and therefore the GLB can be a city car as well. I think both of us are leaning a little bit towards the GLB, right? But there's one important factor that we haven't considered yet and that's the price. Now here's where it gets really interesting. We have the 254 Matic for both of these, right? The GLA in Germany starts at around 57,000 euros and the GLB starts at around 59,000 euros. That sneers makes no difference, the same price. So you really look at what you're getting for the car and what suits your purposes more. And there, I think the GLB does everything the GLA can and has the extra added practicality. Therefore, you're getting more for the money and this is my pick of the two. But why don't you compare it with some other cars in the segment or cars from a higher segment as well? And let me know what you would take at the end of the day in the comments below.